Hello and welcome to Cure Talks. I'm Priya Menon, your host. The topic for today's Cure Talks discussion is inner race to cure HIV, gene therapy, vaccines, and other approaches. HIV research has come a long way since the disease was discovered in the 1980s. Antiretroviral therapy was a major milestone that changed the lives of millions. But the goal now is to find an HIV cure. And we have with us Dr. Pablo Tevish, Director and the Principal Investigator of the AIDS Clinical Trial Unit and Professor of Medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Joining Dr. Tevish on the panel is patient advocate David Stanley. Welcome to Cure Talks, everyone. Thank you. Dr. Tevish, it's a Pleasure to have you here with us today, me and David. We have a bunch of questions for you. I will start <laughs> with a few of mine and then hand over to David for his. Um, about 10 years ago, an HIV patient was cured of the disease for the first time anywhere in the world. Now, the, Berlin, the Berlin patient, Timothy Ray Brown, he received a bone marrow transplant from a donor who was naturally resistant to HIV. He has remained of antiretroviral therapy since the day of his transplant. And recently, last week, we have a second documented patient to claim an HIV cure. Uh, the Esperanza patient, whose immune system seems to have naturally cured her of HIV. Dr. Tabers, my first question is, what does a cure mean for HIV? And why is eradicating HIV proving to be so challenging? Well, cure means a lot for HIV because it's, it's such a stigmatizing disease that the idea that you can be cured for, is incredibly powerful and meaningful for HIV infected patients. And there has been more cases of curing HIV. There was a London patient, similar to Timothy Ray Brown, that received an allogenic bone marrow transplant from somebody that doesn't have the core receptors for HIV. And we know, it seems that you can cure HIV by doing that, by removing completely your immune system, putting a new immune system that's a bone marrow transplant that cannot replicate the HIV virus. The case from Esperanza that was published a, a month ago is a little mm -hmm. bit different because that patient didn't receive a bone marrow transplant and was infected, treated very quickly. And it seems that the infection never took over. And then finally, they stopped therapy and, and she, she has not rebounded and they cannot find the virus in her. So they call it, okay. it's, it's a cure. It's sometimes difficult to define what a cure is. Uh, there are two types of cures. And let's start with definitions. One is what we call a sterilizing cure. That means that if you look into the cells of the individual infected uh, with HIV, you cannot detect the virus. That's what happened with Timothy Brown. That's happened with the London patient. That happened with another patient called the Dusseldorf patient. Now they call them, depending on the city that the bone marrow transplant was done. But that's incredibly difficult to do because this is a retrovirus. It infects the cells and it stays there. So eliminating completely all the traces of the virus is difficult. What we call a functional cure is, is a different concept is that you don't have to take medicines every day. The treatment now for patients living with HIV is that you have to take pills every day. It's a chronic disease. So we want to do things to the immune system of the individuals to try to maintain the virus suppress and that so people uh, don't need to take medicines every single day of their lives. And that's what we call a functional cure. And I think that's our aim right now. It would be great to have an sterilizing cure that's a very difficult aim uh, to aim for. But understand, uh, a functional cure, not having to take pills every day, I think is possible. I don't know if we will do it, but I think it's possible. Thank you, Dr. Tabers. Uh, you know, for the benefit of our listeners, I want to take a step back and ask my second question, Dr. Tabers. If a person gets uh, an HIV positive diagnosis, what is the current standard of treatment for HIV that will be available to the patient now? So the current standard of treatment is use uh, what we call combination antiretroviral therapy. It used to be mm -hmm. three different molecules, but now they combine them in a single tablet. Now we know that we have very powerful drugs. Sometimes you can maintain suppression. HIV, the, the virus doesn't replicate, just taking two different molecules, also in some, a single tablet. 
And that's the current standard of care. And we have medicines that are much better tolerated than 20 years ago when they have a lot of side effects. The medicines nowadays are very well tolerated and they, they have side effects. Any medicine has side effects, but yes. the side effect profile is tolerable. So most of the people living with HIV, they are taking one or several pills a day to control their HIV virus. They maintain viral suppression, so the virus cannot replicate and and they live a completely normal life. Um, they can they can have kids because if if your viral load is, uh, is suppressed, you don't transmit the HIV virus to others. It's called uh, undetectable meek equals untransmissible, and they can have a completely normal life. It doesn't mean that HIV is not is not a stigmatizing disease. It's still incredibly stigmatizing, particularly yeah. in in some uh, social groups. Uh, the, is, the general feeling in society about HIV has improved dramatically with the new treatment and the, the, now the understanding of that people have different sexual orientations and everybody needs to be respected. But the disease is very stigmatizing, particularly in, in some communities. I, I have many patients that live in West Philly, West Africa, they're still hiding their medicines. They're still not telling their families about their diagnosis. And it's still a very stigmatizing disease because of all the connotations around HIV and all the history about HIV. The situation has improved, but not completely clear. So, but the treatment, the standard of treatment is taking two or three molecules that block the HIV virus from replicating. And now, the, the different molecules have been put in single tablets, so the patients tolerate it much better. Uh, so do these patients have to be on this uh, treatment for their lifetime, or do, can they take therapy breaks? No, for the for, for what we know, you this is a, a disease that if you stop the treatment that is successfully treating you, mm -hmm. it, the virus comes back uh, very quickly. It takes around two to four weeks to come back uh, from, uh, from the reservoirs. And uh, is a, as far as we know now, it's a treatment for life. There are very few people that can control the virus in the absence of therapy. We call them post-treatment uh, controllers or, 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 or elite controllers, uh, but they are, they are very interesting because that's where we wanna go, is uh, the immune system controls the virus but they are very infrequent, less than 1%. So for 99% of the people, having HIV means that you have to take medicines every day of your life, which is another problem with HIV, is that every day you get reminded that you have this infection. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So uh, as I understand, what makes HIV so dangerous is that it attacks the immune system, leaving people unprotected against infections. Uh, Dr. Tabers, uh, gene therapy can be used to eradicate HIV or immunotherapy can be used to contain HIV. Uh, and these are being explored as potential approaches. What according to you, like which do you think would be, is more likely to lead to an HIV cure? I think we are learning that it's like in, in the old days with HIV, we started giving one drug to patients mm -hmm. with HIV. We, we figured out that the virus gets around one drug that we needed two, and then we we realized that we needed a combination of three. So in order to get to this functional cure of HIV, I think we're gonna need combination therapy. We're gonna need multiple interventions that will do something to your immune system that will allow the immune system of the individual to control the HIV virus. So it might be something to decrease the HIV reservoir where the virus hides and that can be targeted gene therapy, for example, with CAR T cells or with monoclonal antibodies, plus something that is gonna modify your immune system to control the virus, maybe a therapeutic vaccine against HIV. I don't think it's gonna be a single magic bullet that is gonna get rid of this. It's gonna be a combination approach. And after that, hopefully, at least a significant proportion of people will be able to control the virus in the absence of antiretroviral therapy. That's the holy grail. That's where we want to go. And uh, we are in a good starting position because people, if you take the pills, you're doing well. And so we have, we have to figure this out, but 
uh, it's not that people are dying like the early 90s. Uh, but uh, do you think that uh, these kind of therapies, both immunotherapy and gen genetic therapies, can be scaled up for use in lower income settings as well? I mean, that's also the ultimate goal. Uh, I think at the beginning, all these therapies are very fancy. They are uh, only done in a few centers around the world. And, uh, but later on, things evolve. And, and it, might be, it might be easier to do globally. So gene therapy now is very ex is expensive and it's only yes. done in, 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 in some, a few centers in, in, the, in, the, in the world. But maybe in the future, we can deliver gene therapy with an injection. And then it, it might become something that is uh, affordable for the rest of, for the whole world. At, this, at the present time, these are really small studies, proof of concept studies, ideas that need to be tested. And then when something works, then we, we have to figure out how to implement uh, for the, the whole world. There is around 40 million people living with HIV in the world. It would be great to have uh, 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 the potential of, uh, of uh, a functional cure for them. And when we figure it out in small studies, then we can figure out how to do it uh, at, the, at the global level. Is, as I said, is the holy grail. <laughs> is the impossible dream <laughs> of the song. One last question before I hand over to David, uh, Dr. Tabor. Uh, the success of the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines uh, from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna has given many HIV advocates hope that a preventive mRNA vaccine for AIDS is on their horizon. What is the vaccine scenario for uh, HIV AIDS? Well, things are changing. I mean, we have had HIV infection for almost 40 years. I think the cases, the first, well, first, well, 40 years. It was described yeah. in June of 18, 1981. Yeah. So, and but we don't have a vaccine, despite that at the beginning, we thought this was going to be a piece of cake, which was not. It, the virus changes. There is an incredible diversity of the virus and the virus changes uh, quickly uh, with pressure. So creating a vaccine is difficult. Now people are very attuned about different strains of viruses because of COVID, you have the Delta virus and everyone is spreading. And so your immune responses are, you, when you get vaccinated, you develop an immune response very strong against the protein that they are injecting you or the mRNA or that is producing the protein that you are getting antibodies to. But the virus can change and those antibodies might not be protective. So we know, for example, with COVID, you have vaccines that are very effective, but for some strain of the virus eh, are less effective. Dr. Fauci loses sleep, I am 100% sure. Yeah. He is thinking about a strain of virus that will not be sensitive to the uh, antibodies produced by the vaccine. So far, the vaccine seems to be working well. So if you have not get vaccinated, please do. Uh, but uh, that's the issue. The virus changes and then the immune responses are not, uh, uh, doesn't respond. With the COVID vaccine, we have learned that we can, develop, this is an incredible technology and Penn was part of the discovery and the development of this technology is a way to deliver this mRNA vaccine, a way to deliver the antigens. Your muscle makes the, pro the, the protein and your, anti your immune system reacts to that protein making protective antibodies. It's an incredible technology and it has been developed so quickly because of COVID. And we hope that that technology can be applied to HIV to develop a better preventive vaccine. The NIH is starting studies right now as we speak using a mRNA technology to deliver trimers. So the protein that the virus uses to enter the cell is a trimer, it's, it has like three things, and it binds to the CD4, and they are injecting trimers delivered by mRNA technology. So people develop neutralizing antibodies against HIV. Will it work? I don't know. We're at the beginning of the development. We need to learn more about how to present the antigen to the immune system. So how to present this protein to the immune system to see if we can develop neutralizing antibodies. There is a lot of interest to develop uh, 
use this technology both for prevention and for therapeutics as part of a strategy for a functional cure to vaccinate people that are already infected with HIV to see if we can improve the immune response against their own virus and see if they can control the virus. So there is an intersection in fields in medicine all the time. And so the, the COVID vaccine was made possible by a lot of the research that was done in HIV. And now a lot of the research that has been done for COVID will impact back into HIV in cancer therapies and other things. But there is all this continu continuous dialogue between different areas of medicine. And I think there is a lot of promise with this, uh, with these new methods to deliver vaccines. So we'll see. I mean, people, it's not because we are trying, <laughs> people are trying very hard to try to develop these new vaccines into a, a prevention and therapeutic intervention. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Uh, I'd like to get David on now. Uh, David Stanley is a cancer and men's health advocate. He is also an author, teacher, a voiceover actor, and an audiobook narrator. David, all yours. Hi, David. Great. All yours. Doctor, pleasure to meet you. This, I, I love doing these cure it. talks because I get to talk to some of the most interesting people in, in science. So when uh, when Priya asked me to do this, I was I was pretty excited because your work's your work's well well. And it's renowned. Let's go with that. Now, um, my questions kind of jump all over the place because I did submit them to you ahead of time. So I'm going to ask them to you maybe a little bit out of order. Also, That's in fine. respect to the, the also in respect to some of the answers you've already given it, to Priya's questions, too. Um, okay. I am. Uh, look at this face. I'm old enough to remember the original AIDS epidemic. And I lost some friends. Uh, my dad was a proctologist. And here at the height of the AIDS epidemic in our county, 500,000 people, he was the only proctologist that would treat uh, men with HIV AIDS at that time because the rest, you know, the rest of the physicians, whether they were scared or they were, you know, prejudiced and biased, um, they, they weren't willing to take that on. And then um, Arthur Ashe died in 93 from, a, from AIDS that he got during the blood transfusion, of course, during a heart operation. And I, it seemed to me at the time that there was a kind of a big sea change in attitudes towards AIDS. If an icon who was known to be heterosexual, like uh, Arthur Ashe could come down with AIDS, it could happen to any of us. Um, and do you think, and at that point we started seeing, by the way, a step up in funding. Do you think uh, 30 years later, HIV AIDS is receiving its fair share of governmental funding? to continue the research that was really kicked into gear during that era? I think, I think so. I mean, uh, the, the pandemic, I mean, HIV is, is also a pandemic it studied in the 80s. It was terrible. I remember Rock, Rock Hudson was the prototypic of masculinity in movies right. in, or, yeah. or TV shows at that time. And he was a closeted uh, man who had sex with men. And, and died of, of, of HIV early. Freddie Mercury, who was the singer of Queen, or, or uh, I mean, Arthur Ashe, a, a famous tennis player. I think all of that famous people contributed to normalize, uh, to make it, to make the community more aware that this happened to a lot of people. And if they helped to reduce the stigma about HIV. That trigger, a funding uh, that started in the at the beginning of the 90s. And I think the main trigger was a kid uh, uh, called Ryan White. Ryan White was a kid that uh, had, uh, had hemophilia. And uh, he was kicked out of several schools because he had HIV. And then there was this cry of, of community saying, Oh, he's an innocent victim. There is no, there are no uh, innocent and, and guilty people. There are just people living with with a problem. Anyway, he then Congress passed this this act called the Ryan White Title Act, which is still ongoing. That provides funding to cities and to uh, communities uh, to provide care for HIV, and also created economic incentive for. Uh, pharmaceutical companies to develop drugs because then they would be covered by, by the insurance that the Ryan White provided. And that changed the field completely. 
the pharmaceutical industry got together and developed new drugs to treat HIV and a combination. There was funding to do this research also in the NIH, at the NIH level and has remained flat, which means has it decreased a little bit over time because inflation, but the, the level of funding for HIV, I mean, is not extraordinary, but it's, it's reasonable for the amount of people that are infected with HIV. But the impact of that funding goes well beyond HIV. I know that there is this criticism in a community and in some uh, groups that say, oh, the HIV exceptionalism, that, oh, they get too much funding, they have funding to do research. When you do fund HIV research, you are not only funding HIV, learning how to use lentiviral vectors, all the developments in cancer treatment to treat cancer with using a gene therapy come from HIV because the, the vectors that we use are basically a retrovirus that you put the genetic information that you need to fight against uh, a leukemia. So as I said, there is a lot of interaction between different fields. The level of funding for HIV, I think is, is, is reasonable. I don't think we can ask for more because the, there is other priorities society, but uh, less will have a dramatic impact, not only on HIV, but also in other areas of medicine. Thank God, the, and thank to these treatments, the stigma of HIV, as I said before, has decreased, and, and now we can talk about HIV. There's still groups that there is a problem with that. I don't, I don't know if I answered your question. No, that was, that was in, it, in yeah. This tan, in these tangent, tangents that I don't know. Right. No, I think that was, I think that was spot on, because, yeah, there's a, uh, there is a lot of um, crossover, as you've mentioned, between the different disciplines in, in epidemic error in health and medicine. And it's, it's the rising tide lifting all boats idea that, hey, this is working for that guy. In fact, I, I'm a melanoma survivor and Dr. Mm -hmm. Newbig was, um, who's been working with some uh, essentially, you know, the, some MRA technology to interrupt uh, MRA transmission. Um, you know, he came upon that, one of his postdocs came upon that because they were doing some work in scleroderma. And somebody said, hey, you know, I wonder if this might work over here. And, you know, obviously very early on in the, in the concept, but uh, it has been showing promise. This thing that they were doing with scleroderma is showing promise for melanoma. So I think it's important that the funding be even handed. And that's exactly what you were talking about. Now, yeah. you mentioned uh, retroviruses which is, you know, we all, you and I understand what that means, but HIV being this double-stranded RNA retrovirus, can you explain that uh, in layman's terms? Because it's a term we use a lot when we're talking about this, but it's a term that not many people actually understand. In biology, things go from, normally go from DNA to RNA to protein, and then yeah. it, that's the, the it, and that used to be a dogma until retrovirus were yeah. discovered that the information goes backwards, go from RNA to DNA, and then back to RNA and protein. So retroviruses are viruses that they have, every virus has a life cycle. I mean, it's, it's like people or animals too. I mean, everybody has an IR cycle they, they, and they go. So retrovirus enter the cell and then insta instead of replicating in the cytoplasm, they the retrocrans thrive. So it's an RNA virus, it becomes DNA and they integrate in the nucleus, in the chromosomes. And then from there, they start replicating and making a copy, RNA copies. They start transcribing protein and, and making a copies of themselves. And that's the problem of retrovirus, is that they become part of yourself. They, they are part of your DNA. So is, is, viruses like the flu virus or COVID virus, they don't replicate, they don't integrate in the chromosome. They don't have these, they don't become part of yourself. And, and that's what makes HIV so difficult to eradicate because they become part of your DNA. You cannot eliminate all of the copies of the virus. You can cure COVID, you can cure flu, you can cure hepatitis C because these are viruses that their life cycle doesn't involve integration into the chromosome. And, and that's the, 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 the problem uh, uh, with retroviruses. But retrovirus have been here for millions, probably billions of years. 
And they, there has been many retroviruses. There are some retroviruses that are, they have become part of our DNA. So 9%, uh, a significant amount of our DNA comes from retrovirus that is called endogenous retrovirus and is just sitting there, not doing anything. HIV is a retrovirus, it integrates, and that's what makes it so difficult to cure because it's part of everybody, <laughs> of cells in your body. And in order to eradicate, you have to eliminate all the cells. And you can only do that with a bone marrow transplant. That happened with Timothy Brown. So it's just what it is. That's like the best explanation I've ever heard of that. So uh, thank you for that. Now, um, COVID has about 29,000 base pairs that uh, in most of the strains, we're looking at about 29,000 different base pairs of uh, in its genome. Spanish flu epidemic, near as we can tell, was around 13,000. HIV, according to what I've read, is around 10,000, maybe even less. And, it, and is it, it, does the size of the genome contribute to the difficulty or is it primarily the retrovirus issue because Spanish flu and COVID are not retroviruses? Yeah, I think it's, it's more the, the type of life cycle. Viruses are these small things. I mean, yeah. 10,000 base pairs is not that many proteins. But they have is is the amazing thing about life, isn't it? That uh, some people don't consider the virus alive, but is the capacity to replicate and continue. You don't need that much information. I mean, the HIV virus has a few proteins, and the and then the, the genome and a few enzymes, three critical enzymes. So yeah, it's a damn ten thousand base pairs that is very difficult to completely uh, eliminate. But the part of the problem, as I said before, is, is the life cycle that goes through integration in the chromosome. If it was a virus that it was just replicated in the cytoplasm of the cell, like the flu or the COVID or hepatitis C or other viruses, that they don't have a reservoir. They don't integrate. So your, your immune system mounts a response, eliminates it, and that's it. The other, pro the other viruses are, are, are uh, the retroviruses are difficult to eradicate. There is other virus, hepatitis B, that is, it doesn't integrate. It creates a, like a circle of DNA in the nucleus, but it's also very difficult to eradicate because it becomes part of, of your genetic information. Uh, this is not strictly speaking an HIV AIDS question, but uh, we have in our human genome, what, 3 billion base pair roughly. Uh, a lot of that DNA doesn't code for anything that we've been able to discover. You know, it's essentially spacer or that sometimes they call it junk DNA. Um, to the best of your knowledge, is, is any of that uh, uh, space filling DNA in our genome uh, retroviruses? Yeah, a significant amount of, of the DNA uh, are retroviruses, fragments of retrovirus uh, that have been there for evolution. It's very difficult to know. I mean, call something junk DNA is difficult uh, right. because we don't know a lot of the functions of the of the of the genome. And but some of those uh, parts of information are, are not transcribed. They don't make a protein, and they are rather just sitting there uh, because a few. Not, not even us. I mean, a few mi million years ago in the mammal, they, they were infected and, 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 uh, and they became part. And that's the way that it increases diversity. So if you look at it, for example, a mammals, mammals, uh, some of them have placenta, some of them don't have placenta. So you have the kangaroos, they don't have placenta. They, 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 that's why they have the babies on this bag because they don't have a placenta. They, they, the pregnancy is outside. And the, the, the information to make a placenta, which is a trophoblast, is anyway, comes from an endogenous <laughs> retrovirus. Wow. So it was genetically, cool. a, a mammal was infected and that they started, and that provided a survival advantage and that's how that evolution happened. So retrovirus provide genetic information, is genetic information that is transferred from one place to the other and it, it can affect evolution. So yes, a lot of our genome is all retroviruses that as part of the evolution from billions of years before we were, hum we were humans and they have been part of our, our evolution. So yeah, they are important. In, in it. You know, listening to you, it reminds me of that quote, uh, all biology is evolutionary biology. Yeah. I think Stephen, <laughs> I, think, I, I think Stephen Lander said that. It's a great quote. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions about um, HIV AIDS and COVID. 
Um, in general, is the COVID-19 vaccine safe, uh, efficacious for those who are HIV AIDS positive? Definitely. I mean, uh, the vaccine is efficacious in HIV patients. In patients with immunosuppression, vaccines are less effective than in the general population, but they are still effective. I mean, and uh, my, my wife uh, takes rituximab. Uh, the vaccines are less efficacious on her, but she definitely takes the vaccine. The same for HIV. Some patients with HIV that are taking medicines, they have a normal, completely normal immune system, normal response to the vaccine. Some people early on the treatment of HIV when low CD4 count and more immunosuppression, the vaccine works less well, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It works, it works. And we use it a lot. Patients with HIV do not seem to have more severe COVID than people without HIV. However, they have more risk factors that affect. So they, among patients with HIV, there is more diabetes, there is more cardiovascular disease, there is more uh, lower socioeconomic background. All of those are risk factors that predispose people to have more severe COVID. HIV patients, because they belong to those groups, they can have more severe COVID, but it doesn't seem that it's related to being infected with HIV per se, which is different. So it, it's not just the HIV virus, it's all the comorbidities that go together with HIV, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, obesity, those kind of, kind of things make people with COVID sicker and it, because the HIV patients are part of the same group, they can have similar problems. Anyway. Are you seeing any interesting or different side effects in your patients with the COVID vaccine, uh, people in your groups, as we, than uh, the normal side effects that most of us are experiencing after the uh, COVID-19 vaccine? I mean, COVID vaccine side effects are rare. Of course, you have a bias in a hospital like Penn because you get the, the, the rare events yeah. and here right. for evaluation. So I have seen a couple of cases with a thrombosis associated with a, the, a, the COVID vaccine, but those things are in extraordinarily rare. I mean, it's extraordinarily rare. The main side effect of the COVID vaccine is not taking the COVID vaccine. And I have seen a lot of people <laughs> right. admitted yeah. to, uh, to the <laughs> hospital because of not taking the COVID vaccine. Right. And I will encourage everybody uh, to yeah. take uh, the COVID vaccine. It decreases the risk of complications. It's not a perfect vaccine. There is nothing perfect in this world, and, but it decreases your risk of, of, of uh, being admitted and having a, a complication. Look at Philadelphia. Philadelphia, there has been 100,000 cases of COVID, more or less, 100,000 cases. 2,000 people, close to 2,000 people have died. So if you get COVID, I mean, you might be young and everything, and you might not have any problems, but your chances overall in a population level is around one or 2% of death. Vaccine, problems with vaccine, one in a million. So, you know, yeah. if you're a better and you go to right. Atlantic City to, to gain, yeah. I am not a gambler, yeah. You will take the, the good dose, and the good dose is to yeah. just take the vaccine and, yeah, get, and the get vaccinated and get over. Side effects, sure, arm pain, and yeah. those are the more common things. You feel lousy the following day, yeah, I did. but that's it. I yeah. think that's it, and then it's, it's over. So on the balance of things, is always in favor of, of the vaccine. Is it perfect? Right. No, it's not perfect, yeah. but it's a lovely yeah. So I have, to, respecting your time here, doctor, I've got, uh, two questions, two more questions for you, because uh, Priya had said uh, 9.45. Um, sure. So you're, you're currently at work on a couple of gene therapy projects that look really interesting. Um, could you break down how gene therapy works, <clears throat> excuse me, for, for the listeners and uh, what you feel are the outlooks for these trials that you're, uh, that you're leading right now? So as part of this continuous dialogue, dialogue between oncology and infectious diseases, they, one of the gene therapy studies that we are doing is taking advantage of all the improvements on, on CAR T cell therapy. So CAR T is chimeric antigen receptor, that's the CAR, which is a nice acronym because CAR is a CAR. So you put a T cell receptor 
you you basically engineering a T cell receptor, and the the T cell receptor is the molecule in the surface of the cell that the the cell uses to bind or to recognize a cancer cell. And we are doing the same idea to try to recognize HIV infected cells. So HIV infected cells, the reservoir, what we were calling before the reservoir, those cells express some proteins in the membrane that tells the immune system, oh, this is an infected cell. So I need to eliminate this cell. So we are trying to create those cells that are going to recognize HIV infected cells to eliminate this CAR T cell therapy. The same thing that was developed a few years ago to eliminate leukemic cells for uh, the use CD19 CAR T. So basically they, they recognize a protein in the leukemic cell CD19 that these T cells bind and then start secreting molecules to eliminate those cells. The same idea we're trying to develop to eliminate HIV infected cells with CAR T cells. And that's the gene therapy study that we are doing. We have enrolled a few people. There are interesting results in one or two people. It seems that the virus doesn't, uh, didn't come out, but it's still we, we were in the exploratory phase. But uh, basically with uh, that gene therapy, we are trying to create a T cell immunity against HIV. There is a lot of people doing many other things, fancy things with gene therapy. So now we know that if you give an antibody, monoclonal antibody, uh, people with HIV, you give enough of the monoclonal antibodies and you maintain the levels, the virus cannot come out. It's like a long acting antiretroviral therapy. So the idea is that there are some groups delivering the antibodies instead of an infusion every uh, three weeks or eight weeks, they are delivering the antibodies with gene therapy. So they take cells, they put the information, they put them back, and those cells make antibodies to suppress the virus. Of course, everything like is still on the development phase. There are people, for example, in Temple, Dr. Kalili is working using CRISPR-Cas9 technology to wow. try to remove the HIV virus from the infected cells. Very difficult because there is a lot of copies of the HIV virus, but they are starting trials to try to see if they can clean the, the infected cells using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So there is different gene therapy approaches uh, against uh, HIV. Some of them are developing res new responses. Some of them are trying to make the body produce something that is going to prevent the virus from coming out. And some technologies are trying to remove the HIV virus. And what will, after a few years, what will it stay? I don't know, but maybe it will be a combination of the three of them. Right. That's what we're doing for gene therapy for HIV. Very interesting. One last question for me and then back to Priya. Um, sure. You began your career as an infectious disease expert. What drew you, uh, what drew your interest to HIV AIDS? Hmm. I mean, it's a heck of a puzzle. I get that from a science <laughs> perspective. It's a great puzzle, but you know, usually there's some passion in your voice. Uh, so I, I sense that there's something else at play here. And if you don't mind uh, talking about it for a minute or two, I'd love sure, to hear. Sure, sure. I mean, I I was an internal at first. My first few patients with HIV, I, I I saw them when I was in training in Spain in 1980. 889 I was in the hospital doing my residency and and we saw some of these patients with HIV and as you said uh, nobody there was a lot of rejection including into the medical group uh, into the medical people and I I I really like infectious diseases and I thought you know I love I, I really like to take care of these patients. I was always a contrarian. That would, my parents would tell you that I was always a contrarian. And I say, so if nobody wants to take care of you. I'm gonna do it <laughs> because I like this idea. And, and then I, I enjoy doing it. I learned so much from, from the, the, taking care of these patients. They are, uh, at the beginning, it was very overwhelming for them uh, and for, for me personally. And over time, all the progress in science, but, but it was at the beginning, it was mainly a, a human interest on, 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 on people that were a, very re rejected from, from the medical establishment. 
and and that uh, drove me to to HIV. Then I the first job that I had after finishing school, I in Spain you have to do an exam after a, a few months, so you, you have time to prepare for the exam, but you can work as a physician. Uh, was substituting for uh, somebody in prison. In a prison, I was a prison doctor for a couple of months, and I learned an unbelievable amount there. There was a lot of IV drug use, and a lot of people with in that place ha were having HIV, and and I started seeing patients with HIV, and I realized that really we need to work on this disease because it, it was incredible what was happening, and I, that basically made me passionate about it, and I, it stays with me for the whole. Uh, my whole training and then when I came to the U.S. to train in infectious diseases it was at the peak of the epidemic and and I really like it so yeah. I started continue to do it. It's your corazon huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you you're such an engaging speaker doctor this has really been a pleasure and and such great information this has really been uh it's oh, it's thank you. been a great experience for me to listen to you to speak about this thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tabers. Um, uh, although there are several approaches that could eventually uh, bring a functional HIV cure, Dr. Tabers, as you mentioned, there are still some challenges ahead. The virus inserts its DNA into long-lived cells in the body where it may lie dormant for decades, uh, the so-called HIV reservoir, and add to it the ability to quickly mutate and develop resistance. However, given the remarkable advances in cell and gene therapy over the past years, um, as we just heard Dr. Tabor's talk, the field is well positioned to address these challenges and their immense potential will open new venues for developing a cure for HIV. So with that, we are wrapping up today's discussion. Dr. Tabor's, I totally agree with David. It's been a pleasure um, to listen to you. And thank you so very much uh, for taking time to join us on Cure Talks today. Um, David, thank you. I think those are some of the great questions and you drew Dr. Tevez out to talk about how he came and started working on AIDS. I think uh, that is something that the AIDS community should definitely know how much he loves working with them. So it's been really great talking to both of you today. Thank you so much. We also thank the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the talk will be available on curetalks.com. Uh, thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you very much for the invitation and enjoy the holidays for to you and the, your audience. And uh, the World AIDS Day is an important day to bring attention to HIV and to this goal of curing HIV. And yes. we have to work this together with the community yes. of affected people. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you.